verses, and we don't even know what we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or we don't even know what we're saying to Him. So this is the most important thing to know, something that's repeated so much, and something that's in the form of a du'a, a supplication. We need to know what we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we're going to explore some of the meanings, as much as time permits, of these beautiful verses. These verses are so important. Ibn Abbas and some people still the narrates at one time, the Prophet was sitting in Jibreel. These verses are like any other verses in the Quran. They were revealed in a very special way, very different from the rest of the verses. So Ibn Abbas, he narrates that the Prophet was sitting in Jibreel, alayhi wa salam, and they heard a noise coming from up above. And Jibreel, he looked up at the heavens, and he said, Allah Abbas, he is salam. You read, he told the Prophet, this is a door that opened in the heavens and it never opened before this day. It never opened until this day. And then an angel came out of this door and came down to them. And you read, said, this is an angel that came down today and this angel never came down to the earth before. And the angel said salam to the Prophet salam and salam. And the angel said to the Prophet, this is not the angel to be. Abshiru bi nurayn uti tahma wa lam yutahma rabi al Rejoice in the two lights. Giving him the glad to rejoice, glad tidings in the two lights that are being revealed to you and they never were revealed to any prophet before you. And then he said it is Fatiha to Fida, the Surah to Fatiha, and the last verse of Surah to Baba, the last few verses of Surah to Baba. So this is how important we go on and on talking about the virtues of the Fadah in Surah to Fatiha. But this gives you an idea how special the Surah is, how special these seven verses are. So what is the breakdown of this Surah? Seven verses. Three verses in the beginning, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then three verses at the end are the du'a or supplication that we're asking Allah. And the one verse that's right in the middle, three, four, three after the verse right in the middle, we're making a covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we're, we're affirming something for Him. So what is it that we're saying? We begin by praising Allah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, in verse number one. We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the Arabic, so eloquent, alhamdulillah, when you use alhamdulillah, you're not just saying alhamdulillah, we're praising Allah. But what you're saying is, all praise belongs to Allah. For Allah is only praise. And for, for, for Allah is only praise. And praise is only for Allah. See the difference? For Allah is only praise. I mean, you know, you think about Allah sometimes when you look at His his mercy and all the blessings he gave us. Nothing comes out of your mind or believe in the, out of the mind of a believer in the heart of a believer except praise. So for Allah is only praise. And also all praise is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that if there's any good in the world, if there's any blessing that we enjoy, if there's anything that we like, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the credit goes to Allah and not to anyone else. So praise is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like when you go, you find a picture, somebody made a picture, or, or one of your children made an artwork, and you look at that picture and you say, wow, it's kind of a nice picture. What are you doing when you say that? You're praising the one who made the picture. So when you look at the world around us, even those who don't recognize Allah, whether they admit it or not, the believers, when they see something beautiful and nice, something that pleases them, they say, Alhamdulillah, they say, Mashallah, SubhanAllah. Praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even those who don't recognize Allah, they praise what they see, but indirectly they're praising Allah because Allah is the one who gave all that. Everything comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the first lesson. That if there's anything good in this dunya and this world, anything worthy of praise, anything that we like, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the praise belongs to Allah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next two verses, and in this beginning verse, shares three of the beautiful attributes and his characteristics. In other words, he's telling us we praise Allah, or all the praise belongs to Allah, and then he tells us the reason why. 
praise belongs to Allah because He deserves to be praised. And then the Surah al Nas of the Beast. So the first thing mentioned, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. What is the first characteristic mentioned? Rabbil Alameen. Allah is the Lord, the treasure, the sustainer of the entire universe. So here Allah uses the word Rabb. He doesn't use the word Creator. Too many people in the world have the wrong conception of God. And if you look at most of the most of Muslims today, and even most of the non-Muslims, when they look at their, their understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very limited. They see Allah as a creator, a one-time creator. He created the world and then he took the back seat. This is the general conception of most people in the world today. That if they, most, a lot of people don't even recognize the creator. But those who do, for them it's Allah, and Allah is only a creator. But the Quran again and again reminds us, not just a creator, it's Rabbi Arabi. Rabbi Arabi means not only the one who created, but one who is controlling the fair. Allah created the world and He's in charge of the world. He sustains it, He nourishes it every single day. So He didn't take a backseat like some of the people say. There was an interesting quote I read from a person who's so famous, every single person knows his name, whether you're a child or an adult. There are very few people in the world that you mention their name and everyone knows them. So there's this famous person, his name was Albert Einstein. Who here hasn't heard of Albert Einstein? You know, his name is synonymous with what? With being smart, with being a genius. So now they say in English, you know, I'm no Einstein, but I can understand this. But Albert Einstein had a very interesting quote that gives you the heart of the matter, like what his understanding of, of, of God was. And unfortunately, that's the understanding of the majority of people today. He said, I believe in a God who reveals himself in the natural harmony of all that exists. Again, I believe in a God who reveals himself in the natural harmony of all that exists, meaning in the laws of the universe, the laws of physics, science, and so on and so forth. And then he added that, but I don't believe in a God who concerns himself with the day-to-day -day affairs and fates and doings of mankind. So he believed in the Creator who reveals himself in his laws of nature and science and so on and so forth. But he refuses to believe in a God that involves himself day-to-day -day in the lives of human beings. And unfortunately, this is the belief of the majority of human beings today. In the contemporary modern world, this is, you can summarize, this is the belief of most people. Unfortunately, Muslims, many Muslims are known except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remind us. Our view of Allah, the conception of Tawheed, is not like that. Allah is not a passive God. He created the universe and He's the prop of the universe. He cherishes it, He sustains it, He nourishes it, He is living, training, and you. He's the maintainer. He does, he, He's in charge of affairs. He, he's in charge of every single affair. Not a leaf falls from a tree except for lots of time of He cares about it and He knows about it. So this is what, what we are saying. That's why when we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He deserves to be praised, the first thing we say is, Rabbi Alameen, the cherisher, the sustainer, the maintainer, one who is responsible for the universe. And then we say, Oh Rahman and Rahim, the second thing we say about him, he is Rahman and he is Rahim. And these are the fruit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's character, some of the most important characteristics. Because they talk about his mercy, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Rahman and Rahim is a very rigid meaning, but without getting into the details of what it is, but Rahman and Rahim means Allah is full of mercy, and He gives mercy to others. Allah is merciful to everyone in creation, whether they obey Him or disobey Him. But He is especially merciful to those who believe in Him. Allah is merciful to us in the dunya and He is merciful in the Akha. Many, many meanings. But one of the most important characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we believe He's a merciful creator. He's a merciful God. But many people have this misconception of the God of Islam. He's a harsh God, He's a God of punishment and so on and so forth. You know, our Quran makes you different. This is not the Quran that we keep. That's how the Quran begins. The most important characteristic in the name of Allah, the one who is all merciful and merciful to others, gracious and beneficent. So, our Quran is the name of the
Then Allah described the Quran with a number of characteristics. All of them have to do with guidance. Shabbat Ramadan and the Jews in the Quran, who let me pass, what they did not be in the Buddha, what is Allah. It's a guidance for all human beings, and it's an exposition of that guidance, and it's a Furqan. It also means guidance. Furqan is that which shows you the way from right to wrong. So the Quran, brothers and sisters, is guidance. That is the answer to our du'a that we made so many times. How many of us read it for guidance? So many of us, those of us who don't speak Arabic, we read the Quran in Arabic, which is good. I'm not going to Arabic speak Bible as a reward. But how many of us try to read it for the meaning? The primary purpose of the Quran is to die guidance. So all of us, we should recite the Quran from beginning to end. But those of us who don't know Arabic, we should be reading the Tafsir. We should be reading the translation of Ramadan, because that's the purpose of that's the most important thing in our lives. You know, without guidance, there is nothing. There is a poet who said something very beautiful. Abu Firas al-Kamdani, he said, إِذَا لَمْ يُرْشِدَكَ اللَّهُ فِيمَا تُعِيدُهُ فَلَيْسَ لِأَمْتُوْهِمْ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلِ وَإِذْ لَمْ يَهْلِكَ اللَّهُ فِي كُلِّ مَسْلِكِ لَضَلَّلْتَ وَلَوْ أَنَّ السِّمَاحَ الْغَلِيمِ he said, if we, Allah does not aid you in everything that you ask, then no other person can give you a way, no other creation can find a way for you. And if Allah is not guiding you in every step of your life, the poet says, You are lost. Even if the brightest star in the northern hemisphere, a sima, is guiding you, you are lost. If Allah is not there every step of your way. So we need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. We need to know what we're asking. And the last thing, the last two verses, is a continuation of the du'a. But what do we say? Inna sirat al-musabeen, sirat al-ladina an'amta alayhim, wa'idhim mahmoobi alayhim wa al-dhaadeen. We're basically describing the straight path. So we're asking Allah, show us the way, show us the way to the straight path. And we're clarifying by adding the path of those human beings that you show your favor upon. Not the path of those human beings that incurred your wrath, your anger, nor of those who went astray. And if you look at this last part, it's so profound, the lesson from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the themes of Islam, the Quran, the Sunnah, is that it brings us our minds from the heavens to the earth. It brings us from theory to practicality. It brings us from dreams to reality. So all these verses teaching about Tawheed, Surat al-Mustaqeed, Iyyak al-Aqdu wa Iyyak al-Sa'eed, at the end Allah brings us down to the earth and tells us there are people, there are real role models and like human examples that show you the way. You know, theory is not enough for human beings. The Quran is not a book of philosophy, of theoretical things. It's a book of reality, it's a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is teaching that there are human beings around you that you need to be with. Who are these human beings? In the Tafsir is the Prophets, and the Martyrs, and the Shuhada, and the Salihin, and the Siddiqin. All the people who follow the straight path. So this is an implicit lesson for believers that is traveled by many, many people. And part of following that path, we have to find people who are likewise, who are traveling in the same direction. Find the communities and the Messiah find those individuals who are following that path. And we need to join forces with them and be with them. And we need to avoid those people who are not on the straight path. Those are people who have incurred Allah's wrath and Allah's anger. So these are some of the lessons from Surah Al-Fatiha. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who understand the book of Allah, who read it for guidance, and whose prayers are accepted in this moment from Allah.